Welcome back to the Adam Schefter podcast coming out of week 11, headed into week 12 as we near, amazingly enough, Thanksgiving. Who would have thought that Thanksgiving and the Cooper Rush Tommy DeVito matchup would be upon us this quickly? But it is here we are. And to get ready for week 12 and all that's ahead, we are going to be joined today by a man that I basically cut my professional NFL teeth on, a guy I covered out in Denver for 15 years, one of the greatest NFL players in history, John Elway, a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We got a call recently, asked if we had any interest in putting Elway on the podcast in regards to a medication he's taking. Like, I get the chance to talk to John Elway anytime, anywhere. He, he is always welcome on this podcast. And so John Elway will come by to talk about Bo Nix and Mike Shanahan for the pro football hall of fame and how young quarterbacks do and don't develop in the game of football. But before we get to John Elway, we get to Ty Schmidt of the Pat McAfee show. Who's back this week, as always to quarterback this week's six pack. Pleasure to be back, Shefty. We mentioned it last week, monumental week in the NFL, and it lived up to the billing. So many good games. Um, man, it's crazy. We, we You wait all year for the NFL to start, and then like you said, in the blink of an eye, boom, it's already Thanksgiving. It's just crazy how fast this moves. Um, let's get right into the six-pack, Shefty. Topic number one, that Thanksgiving uh, is going to look a little bit different than we anticipated You know, uh, several weeks ago. Giants, QB change, Daniel Jones officially benched, not just benched, he slid all the way down to three on the depth chart, so that Thanksgiving Day game is going to look a little bit different. Danny DeVito, or Danny DeVito, Tommy DeVito. <laughs> Danny Cooper DeVito Rush. would be good, Ty, yeah. that would be good. <laughs> that would be good, but with that QB change, Shefty, what stands out there? Well, what's amazing is the Giants are going back to where they were last year, and I don't think anybody's surprised that Daniel Jones gets benched with the $23 million injury guarantee due to him. Now, how that would work would be if he wasn't healthy on the start of the league year in mid-March and he couldn't pass a physical, the Giants would have to pay him 12 of the $23 million. And then, if he still remained unhealthy and unable to pass a physical by the time training camp opened, they had owe another $11 million, $23 million total, 12 in March, 11 in July, but the Giants didn't even want to risk it. They essentially ended Daniel Jones' time in New York, barring the unforeseen, because they're not going to stick him back out there now when they have Tommy Danny DeVito as the starting quarterback <laughs> and Drew Locke backing him up. And Drew Locke is a quarterback that they went out and signed during the offseason, paid him $5 million, but Tommy DeVito's outplayed him during practice. And what I find interesting is they're going back to Tommy DeVito because they believe that Tommy DeVito is going to give them a spark. And they believe that he's going to help them win some football games. And when they went to Tommy DeVito last year, the irony of this all is that he went on a three-game win streak last year, ripped off three wins. And as great as those three wins were at the time, they knocked the Giants out of the top five picks and denied them the chance to go draft Jaden Daniels and Drake May. Now, if they had stuck with what they had last year and not gone to Tommy DeVito and lost those games, they would have been in position to take maybe Jaden Daniels or Drake May, two quarterbacks that they certainly explored trading up to get that they couldn't get. So Tommy DeVito cost them a quarterback in the draft in the spring. And now they're going back to Tommy DeVito again. And if Tommy DeVito provides the same spark, it's not the same type of quarterback draft by any stretch of the imagination. By all accounts, the quarterbacks in the upcoming 2025 draft are a notch below, at the very least, the quarterbacks in the 2024 draft. This is not the draft, apparently, according to scouts, that you want to have to rely on to get a quarterback. But if Tommy DeVito plays the way they want and the way they hope, that's going to hurt their draft position again. And it's going to dampen the possibilities of being able to use a high pick on a quarterback. They're not worried about that. Look, these teams are in it to win football games. That's what matters to them. But Tommy DeVito hurt their chances last spring, and he has the potential now 
based on how he plays starting Sunday against the Buccaneers and on Thanksgiving Day against the Cooper Rush-led Dallas Cowboys to hurt their draft chances again. Again, we'll just go back to that. Thanksgiving Day. When the NFL set the schedule, there's no way in hell that they thought America is getting ready to sit down at 4.30 Eastern on Thanksgiving afternoon when everybody's around the TV to watch Tommy DeVito versus Cooper Rush. So it's Thanksgiving with an Italian flair this year, but that's where we're at, Ty. Yeah, and Shefty, I mean, I don't think anyone's surprised by this situation. It seems like every single Monday, or at least the the first several weeks of the season, you were coming on Pat's show, and it was basically you're getting a text like, hey, the Giants are sticking with Daniel Jones. They're sticking with Daniel Jones. So, I mean, the the, the clock was ticking. and <laughs> well, that, That's the amazing part, right? When, when you're answering that every single week that we're keeping this guy as the starting quarterback, it's only a matter of time before that week rolls around where you're not keeping him as your starting quarterback. And the clock finally struck 12. The only upset was that I wasn't on your show, the Pat McAfee show, to release the news that Daniel Jones – Finally had lost his starting job. It should have happened. It should have happened in the 1220 Eastern Monday window when we do the hits, considering all the attention that we devoted to Daniel Jones keeping his starting quarterback job this year. It, I mean, it's crazy. And, and you mentioned it. Thanksgiving, you know, I mean, that seems kind of like cruel and unusual punishment that we're going to have to be watching that game, especially. But although, you know, post post meal, depending on when people have it, maybe that's a an easy little time to take a nap and, you know, maybe just miss that one, <laughs> avert your eyes a little bit. But yeah, I mean, very interesting to see what's going to happen with the whole giant situation. Uh, topic number two. But, but before we get to the topic, two, you brought up a very good idea. They've incentivized everybody to eat as much food as possible to go into a food coma on Thanksgiving, to take a nap during the giants and Cowboys game. There you go. Ty, you just solved America's problem. Yeah. Well, I'll, I, you know, I do my best. I, I mean, whether it's, you know, eating too much food or just trying to get away from your family, I think, you know, averting your eyes from that game probably is the right move. <laughs> Topic number two, Shefty, let's stick in New York. Uh, breaking news today, the the Jets fire Joe Douglas. We talked about it on Pat show earlier today. What do you make of that whole situation? Well, it's amazing just how quickly this whole season has disintegrated for the New York Jets, right? You have a season that started with talk of whether they could make it back to the Super Bowl, whether they can make it to the playoffs. And now they've fired their head coach. They have fired their general manager. They have lost more games than anybody expected. The season hasn't gone the way that anybody planned. They're basically doing a reboot on the entire organization. Now, Joe Douglas's contract was going to be up at the end of this season. And there was every possibility that obviously he wasn't going to return but that's what made the timing strange on Tuesday that with seven games left in the season that they just fire the guy at that point in time. Like, why not let him finish it out and go through the rest of the season? And instead, they appoint the former Browns general manager, Phil Savage, who's a great guy, as the interim general manager. And Joe Douglas, who, by the way, will have a job in this league as soon as he wants one because that's how many supporters, allies, and friends he has. He'll have another job here in no time at all. And I could tell you that he's probably relieved and happy. The Jets gave him an early holiday present. Go home early. Take the rest of the season off. Don't have to be here during this lost season. Get to spend holiday with your families. Get to spend the holidays with your family. And then basically come back and return with another NFL team next season. Again, not how anybody would have drawn it up, not how anybody would have imagined it, but the Jets have turned into one of the season's biggest disappointments, and this is just the latest iteration of that with their team firing Joe Douglas on Tuesday. Pretty pe peculiar, but you know, I think it was Bill Belichick who mentioned it on the Manning cast a couple weeks ago. It seems like Woody Johnson is kind of a ready fire aim type of guy so when stuff like this comes out of nowhere I, I guess you just kind of chalk it up to well that makes sense but we were kind of talking earlier today or I was thinking Shefty if this is a complete reboot here I know he's on he's on the hook next year and they they owe him a bunch of money but do, I mean does that lead you to believe that Rogers you know like that's open book as well they're going to reassess that too here's where I would go with that Ty the head coach that wanted Aaron Rodgers in the GM that wanted Aaron Rodgers in, both have been fired. And Aaron Rodgers has looked like a guy who sometimes as I look at him, I just say to myself, he has to be thinking, 
what am I doing playing this sport? I'm over 40. I've got enough money for the rest of my life. My team is not very good. He just looks like a guy who sometimes has wondered whether he wants to keep doing this. And so I don't know if there's any great yearning on his part to keep playing for the New York Jets. And I don't think there's anybody there with the New York Jets that has any great yearning to keep Aaron Rodgers. And so all the elements are in place for both sides to be able to move on. Now, we'll see what happens. For all we know, they hire Mike McCarthy as their head coach, and Mike McCarthy wants to keep Aaron Rodgers, and these things always can go any which way depending on moves that teams decide to make. But sitting here today in late November, a week before Thanksgiving, it is all set up for the Jets and Aaron Rodgers, I think, to go their own way after the season. All right, well, that's something to keep tabs on. It'll certainly be very interesting to see how that whole situation shakes out. Um, let's move from one dumpster fire to another, Shefty, and topic number three, um, what is going on in Jacksonville? I mean, we saw the press conference with Doug Peterson where it just looks like a guy who's almost just ready to tap out and give up up there. What What is going on with that whole situation? Well, look, by the time we tape this and air this podcast, for all I know, it could be outdated. But for the record, let the record show that we are recording this 415 Tuesday afternoon, November 19th. Here's what we know. We know that there is going to be change that's coming to Jacksonville. We just don't know when that will be. When will the Jaguars owner, Shad Khan, decide to make his move? They are on their bye week this week, coming off what was the worst loss in franchise history, a 46-point defeat against the Lions that exceeded the 44-point defeat that they had in December of 1995 against the Lions. So obviously the Jaguars don't fare well against the Lions, but this was a 46-point loss. They're on their bye. Look, I think it's fair to say that there are going to be sweeping changes in Jacksonville. When they come, we will see. That is up to the owner. But nobody thinks that they're going to return this current organization in its current form for the 2025 season. I think it happens sooner rather than later. I think that Doug Peterson ultimately knows that he's on the hot seat. The general manager, Trent Balky, is on the hot seat. And it won't surprise me if there is an overhaul in Duval. And we'll just wait to see when Shad Khan decides to act. Like, you can't have what he said is the best roster that he's ever had, have a 2-9 and nine record, sign all these players to long-term contracts, and look as disappointing as they have this season. So now you wait for the fallout. And as we recorded 417 right now, Ty, there's still no word from the owner. But by the time we get done taping this, we may have heard from him. Well, and, and you mentioned it, you know, Shad Khan saying, hey, this is the best roster, the most talented roster we've had on paper. Someone asked Doug Peterson that in his press conference, and he kind of just looked at him dumbfounded, like, listen, I never said that. So, yeah. you know, and I and I never talked to him about that. But building a new stadium down there and everything, like, they got to figure it out. You got to hire someone who can turn that thing around and make them a winner. Otherwise, you got a, a very expensive stadium and, and probably not a lot of people wanting to show up to those games. And it's been bad for a while. And I don't know what they do because they've tried all sorts of things and none of it has worked. Urban Meyer didn't work. And Doug Peterson, as I'm a big Doug Peterson fan. I think he's a stand-up guy. But it hasn't worked so far. And so something's going to happen here. Without a doubt. Um, Shefty, topic number four. Let's go from one place uh, changing coaches probably to one place that definitely will not be changing coaches. Pittsburgh Steelers, up to this point, has anyone been more predictable and impressive than Pittsburgh has? I mean, I think we're talking legitimate chance to to make a deep playoff run this year. Isn't it incredible what they do? I mean, it's just, it's it's unbelievable. They play the Browns Thursday night this week. And if they win that game on Thursday night and beat the Browns, Mike Tomlin will have maintained his streak of never having had a losing season in his 17-year head coaching career. Here we are talking about the New York Giants who are struggling, the New York Jets who fired their GM today, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and here we have, at the opposite end of the spectrum, Mike Tomlin, who, if he wins on Thursday night 
and certainly will find that win somewhere along the way sooner rather than later. This will be his 17th straight head coaching year without a losing season. Do you know what they would do for that in New York or Jacksonville? He has become, that organization has become, the model of consistency. And oh, lo and behold, look at that. Look at the coaches. Chuck Knoll, Bill Cowher, Mike Tomlin. The Jets, in a calendar year, will have as many coaches as the Pittsburgh Steelers have had in their franchise history, basically. So this is what you get for basically being patient and stable. And Mike Tomlin just comes in. And you know what they're going to do. They're going to play great defense. They're going to run the football. They're going to take their shots when they can. They're going to win the turnover battle. It's just amazing. Like, you know what's coming. And nobody can stop them. Now, I don't know that in the end that they will beat the Chiefs or the Lions. But, boy, that is a tough team and a quality organization. And they just continue to produce. And at a time and a day and age where we see these franchises struggling to find their footing, where we see these franchises going through GM and coaching candidates on a semi-regular basis, here is Pittsburgh plodding along, doing what they do, never having a losing season. Amazing. It really is. And on Sunday, I mean, to beat that Baltimore team without scoring a touchdown, just ridiculous. I don't Find know a way. It, Find a way. They always it, do. Exactly. And then on top of that, this year, everything with Russell Wilson, where people were killing Tomlin, hey, Justin Fields has got everything going. And for him to have the balls and, you know, just the the wherewithal to be like, you know what? Nope, we're winning. But Russell Wilson is the guy who gives us the best chance to to be the best possible team we can be. And look how that's gone. And by the way, Justin Fields did play very well. And they could have won with Justin Fields. But I think Mike Tomlin felt we need somebody that's going to be able to throw the ball consistently, successfully, and effectively in division games when Baltimore has a weak secondary. And they didn't go in and light it up on Sunday, but they played well enough to be able to do that. And all those people, like all those people questioning Mike Tomlin, what are you doing going to Russell Will? Okay. Okay. You know what? It's like stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Let Mike Tomlin coach. You guys analyze and let him keep making what he believes are the right moves for his team. Without a doubt. I mean, it's, it, it really is remarkable. Uh, Shefty, let's move along. Topic number five from a consummate winner to another one. What about the Chargers and everything that's going on in L.A. with Harbaugh? I mean, it's just it, it it's not the Chargers. This is a completely See, different franchise. That's the whole thing. And that's the whole thing, right? We're talking about Tomlin and consistency. Well, the Chargers also were remarkably consistent for almost the entirety of their franchise history. They were a soft, underachieving team that never played up to its talent level that was basically as tough as the California weather. They just could not be counted on. And they get one guy who comes in there, and it feels like that guy has totally changed the culture and perception of who the Chargers are today in Jim Harbaugh. Jim has done exactly what he's done at every coaching stop along the way. And to me, I look at the Chargers and I say, they are a dangerous football team. They are a team that people is sleeping on. They are a team that can make postseason noise. They are a team capable of beating the Chiefs. They are a team capable of making a Super Bowl run. Now, I don't know how the postseason will go. I don't know if they'll get there. I'll bet they will. I don't know how much noise they'll make, but Jim Harbaugh is, in his own way, as consistent as Mike Tomlin. And his teams are going to play his brand of football. And he was the perfect hire for that. He has been everything that the Chargers never have been. He's tough. He gets the most out of his teams. He plays up to their potential. He is exactly what they needed. And that was the right hire. And he's going to be in a favorite spot to win the NFL coach of the year. And he's totally turned around that team. And again, it's going to be really interesting to see what they do as this season gets late and as they make it to the postseason, because I think people have not talked about the Chargers enough as one of the top teams in the AFC. 
and you said it, I think that's the the best and most refreshing part. He's going to do it his way, right? When he comes in, Joe Alt obviously is a road grader. He's but but that's not really a sexy draft pick for your first draft. You know, for him it is. Guy. For him yeah, it is. He's the exactly. he's the one that's an offensive line or weapons. Exactly. Weapons. Exactly. But but you still have all those people second guessing. Hey, Malik Neighbors is out there. You got Herbert. You just got rid of all your you know weapons on the outside. You need to go get a guy like that. And Harbaugh just said, you know, like, no, we're going to play my way. We're going to win my way. And we said it back when he first got hired on Pat's show. I think, you know, I, I said, I expect them to win 11 games their yep. first year just because that's what Harbaugh does. They just win. It's as simple as that. And winners win. He's a winner. And look what they've done. I mean, Herbert finally is the guy who we always expected him to be. Not that his stats weren't ever great, but you mentioned it. It's just that that game on Sunday night. In the last however many years, they lose that game every single time. The every Bengals, single time. The Bengals come back, and they they choke. It's just the way it goes, but you get a guy like Harbaugh, and and he stops that immediately. It's it's remarkable. It really is. The Chargers right. have chargered in the past, but they are the Chargers no more in their gym. Yeah, and like you said, I think that's one team that a lot of teams in the NFL, the AFC certainly, you're looking at them come playoff time. That is not a team you want to play. No, no, yeah, no. no way. All right, Shefty, let's move on to the sixth and final topic of the six pack. Let's stay in the AFC West. Broncos quietly are are coming on big time. Uh, what do you think has been the most impressive thing about Bo Nix thus far? We interrupt all the talk about Jaden Daniels for offensive rookie of the year for NFL MVP with this public service announcement about Bo Nix. Do you realize this year that through week 11, Jaden Daniels has thrown for 2,338 yards and Bo Nix has thrown for 2,275? So Jaden Daniels has thrown for exactly 63 more yards than Bo Nix. Jaden Daniels has run for 482 yards. Bo Nix has run for 295. So he's run for... 187 more yards than Bo Nix. That's quite a lot. Jaden Daniels has accounted this season for 14 total touchdowns. You know how many Bo Nix has accounted for? 19. 19. Wow. Jaden Daniels is 7 and 4. Bo Nix is 6 and 5. Could have easily been 7 and 4, but he's 6 and 5. And the point being is that as good as Jaden Daniels has been, Bo Nix is coming up the rear right now. And Bo Nix has become a weapon and a force. And by the way, think of the AFC West now. Wow. The Chiefs and Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, the Chargers with Jim Harbaugh, the Broncos with Sean Payton and Bo Nix coming up here. Bo Nix's numbers are great. And he's a rookie and he looks like he's getting better right now. And the Broncos have been such a flat team for the last seven, eight years, and they haven't made any playoff runs. And as somebody who used to cover that team and knows that region well, like there could be few things in sports more devastating to a region than the Broncos being awful, which is what they've been. But Bo Nix has come in and given them a reason to hope. He has put up numbers that are comparable right now to Jaden Daniels. He has pushed himself right into the conversation for the Offensive Rookie of the Year. And I might say, after the Broncos made any number of quarterback missteps and turned to any number of quarterbacks who didn't get the job done, it looks like for now that they finally have landed on a quarterback who can get this team back to the playoffs and make the Broncos relevant 